Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, April the 23rd, 2021. It is currently 1043 a.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm here at Victory Baptist Church, and it is time once again to turn back to a sermon preached by John MacArthur. The best we can figure out is somewhere between 1994 and maybe 1997, somewhere somewhere between 1994 and 1997. Originally, when we started working on this sermon, we thought it was the night I thought, when I say we, I thought it was maybe the 1980s. But it was somewhere in the 1990s, and we think we have it somewhere between 1994 and 1997. Just his voice sounds so different that I thought it had to be the 1980s, um, or just it's the audio that wherever this audio came from, maybe maybe the tape was just, it was at a higher speed. I don't know. His voice at times sounds really weird. So I thought it was way earlier on than it was, but it appears to be in the 1990s. It's a, a, a sermon sent to me by a listener. And he sent this to me because we've been talking a lot about salvation. I've been talking a lot about how many within the Protestant world, we say they say they believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And they, they say they believe that we are saved by an imputed righteousness that, that is imputed to our account because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And then they turn around and seem to contradict that when it comes to uh, certain aspects of salvation. And what do I mean by they contradict that? They say, look, you're saved because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. However, how do you know if you're truly saved with the imputed righteousness of Christ? You have to demonstrate a practical righteousness that reaches a certain level that proves you have the imputed righteousness. But that is illogical and contradictory because an imputed righteousness does not infuse a righteousness into me. It just uh, gives a... It, it, it places a righteousness to my account. It declares to me to be perfectly righteous, even though I'm not righteous. It declares me to be perfectly just, perfectly holy, perfectly obedient, even though I'm none of those things. None of those things are true of me practically. They are true of me in my position before God because of this imputed righteousness. But Protestants, many Protestants do this really weird thing where, no, I believe in the imputed righteousness. However, you're not saved unless you have enough practical righteousness. But imputed righteousness doesn't do anything before my practical righteousness. Now, yes, should I live a life different, differently? Yes. Should I be motivated by God's grace? Because in his grace and mercy, he imputes the righteousness of Christ and his obedience to my account. Yes. Should I continue to live in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But the reality is I'm still going to sin. And I don't know how I can judge the presence of imputed righteousness by the present, with the presence of practical righteousness. It raises all kinds of questions. So I've been asking all of those kinds of questions. And so uh, someone sent me a sermon from John MacArthur on uh, basically what is the gospel? And he thought this would be relevant to some of the things we've talked about. It's been a very interesting listen so far. This is part three. I'm not going to go back and review everything we did in part two. We're just going to jump in and see if we can finish this up in this episode. That's what we're going to do. If you're like, well, what did you talk about in part one and part two? Go listen. That, that's all I can say, right? If I review both parts, this will take forever. But there, there was a lot of very interesting things we we did discover and a lot of interesting topics we we discussed, um, and hopefully you find some of it beneficial. But here we go. We're going to go back to John MacArthur. I don't. I, I'm assuming this was preached at Grace Community Church somewhere in the 1990s. We believe in, we we are thinking somewhere between 1994 and 1997. That's the best uh, I can come up with so far. We've listened to every clue offered in the sermon, trying to figure out the time. The reason the timetable was so important is if this was preached prior to the release of the gospel according to Jesus, where MacArthur really puts forth that lordship salvation perspective, then he may be offering a different perspective and then his views slowly change. If it's after the release of that book, then we're looking to see where that lordship view comes in. And this is obviously after the release of the gospel according to Jesus, because that book was released in 1988. So definitely he's well into the lordship concept. Now we'll see if that if that shows up anywhere in this discussion about the gospel, all right? That's what we're looking for. That's what we're listening to for. All right, here we go. Let's just jump right in. Not going to spend any more time with review uh, or, or I'm not going to do any more introduction. We're just going to finish this up. So here we go. 
so if we're going to have forgiveness, we have to have justification. It's by the will of God, but it's by the act of justification. Somehow God has to declare us just. And how does he do it? By not counting their trespasses against him. Doesn't say he doesn't know about him. He does. Doesn't say they aren't there. They are. It just says he doesn't hold them against us anymore. In fact, that's another way to present it. You say, you know, I'm happy to tell you. I know a truth that can cause God or allow God never again to hold any sin you ever commit against you. Wow. That's the good news, folks. Now, I want you to hear that. He just explained justification as being a truth that I can tell someone that I know a truth about God in which he will never hold any sin you commit ever against you. That's past, present, or future sins. Well, if that's how we understand justification, how can then you go to someone later on and go, wait a minute, look at all these sins you're committing. That proves you were never saved. No, you said my salvation, God would never hold any of my sins I ever commit against me. So how can you say that I was never saved by the presence of sin in my future when you said if I believe in Christ, he takes care of all my sin, past, present, and future? Which is it? If, if God doesn't hold any more sin against me because I'm in Christ Jesus and his righteousness is imputed to my account, then how can you go look at my life and go, but, 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 but look at all these sins. Look at all these sins. This proves you were never saved. No, this would prove that these sins don't condemn me because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. How can you use that to judge someone's salvation? It, it appears that we end up holding to some contradictory ideas that nobody wants to spend the time really thinking about the implications of. We just, this is how we say it. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, because of an imputed righteousness. Got it? Okay. Now, wait a minute. If you don't do this, 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 and this, you are never saved. And nobody ever stops to go, I think we're possibly contradicting ourselves here. And if you ask that question, then you get labeled a heretic or that you're excusing sin or that you think everyone should just live their life in sin. No, I'm saying that we've got to think about how we articulate this so that we don't sound like we are schizophrenic and that we're teaching two opposing views and two opposite views, contradictory views at the same time. All right, let's see what he does here. That's the good news. So it is by the act of justification. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute what? Iniquity. Psalm 32, 2. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account, Romans 4 says. So the only way that God can do this, this plan, is if he forgives you and never holds your sins against you. None of them. Past, present, future. Absolutely none of them. Fully forgiven and you're declared to be righteous. That's the only way it can ever happen. You say, well, I don't know if I can make it. Well, if you were raised a Catholic, you understand how tough that is. This is Roman Catholic theology. I'll give you a little uh, course in Roman Catholic theology. Here's how it works. You want to be justified, made right with God? Here's the process. God infuses grace into you. They use the term infused grace. God infuses it into you. It's grace or slash righteousness. And it's the grace of Christ and the righteousness of Christ. And it's dumped into you. you. The first dose you ever get, you get an infant baptism. That's why infant baptism is absolutely required, because it is the first dispensation of infused grace. And according to Catholic theology, at that point, grace is infused into you. That grace becomes an energy in you, moving you toward justification, toward righteousness, as you cooperate by good works. Every time you go to the mass, every time you do penance, Every time you say your beads, every time you go to confession, every time you do any of that, you get more infused grace. That's why some Roman Catholics go to church seven days a week, because they need lots of infused grace. They operate under fear. That's why they go to confession, not because they want to tell the priest all their sins, but because they want the infused grace that perpetuates them on the process to, to righteousness. If, perchance, as you move along the road, you're getting closer and closer, you commit a mortal sin. Two kinds of sins in Catholic theology. Venial sins, which don't count like big ones, and mortal sins, which are really big. Anytime you commit a mortal sin, you're back to zero again in the process of justification. It's as if you just had infant baptism. You go all the way back to ground zero. 
Most Catholics don't know these nuances at all. All they know is they're working real hard, hoping they can get to heaven. But I'm giving you the inside stuff. This is Catholic theology. Commit a mortal sin, you're back to square one again, and you start the process. Do that when you're 75 years old and you die when you're 76. You've got a long time in purgatory. Purgatory comes from the word purge. And purgatory is where you go because you didn't make it to justification. You didn't make it to righteousness, but you're a good guy and you tried really hard and we can't send you to hell. So we'll invent a place and you go there and over a period of three or four hundred years or whatever it is, you get purged and finally you get righteous and then you can go to heaven. And you can get aided because there are some folks who had more righteousness than they needed. In fact, they were so good they had extra righteousness. And when they died, their extra righteousness was put in what's called the treasury of merit. Treasury of merit is a big, uh, you know, hypothetical box. And God, at his own discretion, could take some of that out and give it to you while you're in purgatory to move you faster along. And that's and, and you just keep we're hoping you're going to get finally to righteous so that Roman Catholic theology believes this. God justifies only the righteous. In other words, you're never going to be right with God until you've achieved righteousness. My Bible says God justifies sinners. And that is the difference. Roman Catholic theology says you'll get justified when you get righteous. The Bible says you'll get justified when you fall on your face and acknowledge you're a sinner. And justification is not a process that finally culminates in purgatory. It's an act that occurs in a moment of time when God declares you righteous and forgiven. That is huge difference. Now, but listen, here's what this is what's so crazy hearing MacArthur say this. And then you go read, you know, the gospel according to Jesus or any of the other books per, per, putting forth the Lordship salvation view, or you even pull out the MacArthur sermon where he gives you the test to see if you're truly saved. I think he gives 11 points to check check to see if you're saved. It's all based off your actions. If you don't do this, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, you're not saved. If you don't do this, you don't do this, you're not saved. If you don't do this, you don't do this, you're not saved. Well, wait a minute. I thought I thought you just said that I am saved by the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's imputed to me and all my sins are taken care of. Well, then how, how can can I then say, I've got an imputed righteousness, but unless it demonstrates itself in practical righteousness, that would then prove I never got the imputed righteousness. That is so backwards, confused. It doesn't make any sense. Yes, I understand that he's going after Catholic theology, but I will argue that we create our own system of Catholicism. We just call it something else. We just call it something different. Because we, we want to do the same thing. That, hey, unless you live a good enough life, you're not saved. Now, we just say that you don't earn it. You just never got it. But, but the way I know I got it is based off what I do. So then when I, so you can't, so here's the thing. You can't tell someone who believes in Jesus, well, you're saved. No, I can't tell them that. I say, well, I don't know if you're saved. I don't know. I don't know. The only way we're, you're going to know if you're saved is if you demonstrate enough righteousness over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And when you get to the end of your life, if you've passed all of these tests that we give you in the Lordship world, then maybe you'll be saved. It's the same thing. you got to cooperate and work with it. It's about, an, it's about a practical righteousness. The imputed righteousness becomes forgotten. Again, when, when you take, if you look at MacArthur's teaching, and, and, I've, and I've done this with my church, we went through all of his tests. He gave a 11, I think it was 11 point test to prove if you're saved. And guess what? None, none of those points looked at. Do you have the imputed righteousness of Christ? No, they never looked. Do you, do you possess the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith? That wasn't one of the tests. It's like, do you love your, do you love God? Do you love your neighbor? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you have a pure heart? Do you, do you, you know, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. What about the imputed righteousness? So it's, it's, it's interesting to hear him say this because I know the rest of his teaching. So, but that's, that's what happens. Sometimes when we preach, we sound like it's like, man, you're saved by grace alone. And then sometimes when we preach, it's like, but you better do this, 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 and this. And it's like the average Christian never stops to go, I think, I think we're, I think we're making this very convoluted and confusing. And we do, right? Now he's got 19 minutes left. Let's see if he offers any, I'm just interesting to see what happens in these last 19 minutes. Here we go. One view saves the other damns because it's a system of works. Sounds good. It's got grace in it. It's got faith in it. It's got righteousness in it. The righteousness of Christ is in it. They use all those terms. 
In fact, this latest document says we Catholics and we Protestants believe in salvation by grace and salvation by faith and salvation in Christ alone. And we believe in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they go and, and an average evangelical. Wow. What else can you say? Salvation by faith, by grace, through Christ alone. And then as a paragraph at the end, it says, of course, we have yet to discuss the doctrine of imputation, the mass and baptismal regeneration. It doesn't mean anything. It's just words. Huge difference. And the way God, listen to this, the way God justifies a person is not by infusing grace in them so they can become perfect, but by not counting their what? Trespasses against them. It's just a matter of God saying, okay, I'm not counting those anymore against you. It's not God saying, oh, there aren't any more there. It's not God saying, well, you've reached the point where you don't have any more trespasses. You can be declared righteous. That's not justifying the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly, the Bible says in Romans. He just doesn't impute their sins. So you can say to a person, you want some really good news? God wants to save you. God wants to justify you and to sanctify you. God wants no longer to count any sin you ever commit against you. Ever. That is good news. So, this whole matter of reconciliation is by the will of God, by the act of justification, which is tantamount to complete forgiveness. Thirdly, and I have to say this, it's by the obedience of faith. It's by the obedience of faith. There's a faith component. Verse 20. We're going around begging people on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. You say, if it's all of God, what are we begging people for? It's not apart from faith. It's not apart from faith. We're begging for a response. And the response is to believe and to receive as many as received him. How can I say it? They became privileged to count themselves as sons of God. It's by faith. So we go around calling people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we, and be saved. Now, you know this. So getting people to understand this and to put their faith in Christ alone to justify them, really what we do. Um, let me just give you a little insight into this. You say, what's the actual message? Well, it comes down to this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, Acts 1631. Believe that Christ... Came into the world, God in human flesh, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death on the cross, rose from the grave, ascended to the right hand of the Father, having accomplished our redemption as our high priest and coming king. That's the, what I call the drive train of, of the gospel. You believe that. You believe in the Christ who is the true Christ and in his death and resurrection for you. And so we call men and women to that faith. We understand that. Men and women are trapped in all kinds of lies and all kinds of deceptions. Uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 calls them fortresses. And we smash those fortresses with the truth. Hoping that the fortress will crash down and we can lead the prisoners captive to Christ. But we call them to faith. Believing. For by grace are you saved, Ephesians 2, 8, through faith. So we say, here, do you want to take the gift? Just trust Christ. Just put your faith... Just affirm you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who lived and died for you and rose again. You believe that? Then acknowledge Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. And receive the forgiveness he offers. But one final point remains, and frankly, all the rest was introduction. I really want to get to verse 21. <laughs> the question is, how do you do this? How in the world could God pull this off? How could he do it? How can he do it and still be just? How, how could God do this? Reconciliation by the will of God, by the act of justification, which involves forgiveness, by the obedience of faith. We just call sinners to belief. How can he do it? How can he reconcile sinners when he's too pure to look upon iniquity, can't behold evil? How can he fellowship with transgressors? How can he satisfy his justice? How can he satisfy his righteous, holy condemnation of sin with full and uh, deserved punishment and still be able to show mercy to sinners at the very same time. How, how can he punish the sin in our lives at one time and make us his own children at the other? How can he punish us without destroying us? How can he end the hostility of those who hated him and take them into his holy heaven? How can he do it? Verse 21 is the answer. Maybe there's a greater verse in the Bible. I don't know. 
Maybe not. Fifteen Greek words. If you understand this verse, you understand the gospel. Fifteen Greek words that define the meaning of the reconciliation message. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's how he did it. That's how God did it. There is the plan. This is the secret of redemption, folks, right here. Understand this verse. He, first one in the verse, he made is God. God is the antecedent at the end of verse 20. Reconciled to God, he made. God is the one who did it. It's God's plan. God designed it, as we said. God devised it. And in order to make it happen, in order to make it work, he made him who knew no sin. Who's that? You don't have a lot to choose from. Him who knew no sin, who's that? Jesus Christ, who, uh, of whom the writer of Hebrews says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He made him who knew no sin. That's so critical. That's so critical. He had to be a perfect Lamb. He had to be without spot and without blemish, right? He made him who knew no sin. Now, here comes the key. The Greek says, He made him who knew no sin. Sin. His sinless son in whom he said, I am well pleased. His sinless son who said in John 8, 46, which of you convicts me of sin? His sinless son, whom Peter calls the just for the unjust, was made sin. What in the world does that mean? Do you know what that means? Kenneth Hagin says it means, I've heard him say it, Christ became a sinner on the cross. On the cross, he became a sinner. Others in the word faith movement say he not only became a sinner on the cross, but he had to go to hell for three days to pay for his sin. And when he finally paid for his sin, God let him come out of the grave. Let me tell you something. That's not anything short of blasphemy. On the cross, Jesus was not a sinner. He's never a sinner before. He wasn't a sinner then. And he never will be. He was as pure and holy and harmless and undefiled hanging on the cross as ever before or since. He is not a sinner, never a sinner. He never broke a law of God and he never failed to fulfill perfectly everything God ever required or desired. And God did not make him a sinner on the cross. That is an unthinkable blasphemy. If he became a sinner on the cross, then he would have to go to hell for his own iniquities. Isaiah 53, 4 and 6 says he was wounded, not for his transgression, but for our transgression. He was bruised not for his iniquities, but for and it was the chastisement for our peace that was put on him. Boy, that is a terrible thing to say. God has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Let me tell you something. You have to understand this. Here's how to understand it. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe. Though, in fact, he committed none of them. Did you get that? God treated him as if he committed personally every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe. Though the fact is he committed none of them. That's the great doctrine of substitution. And that's the first side of imputation. God imputed our sins to him. He was guilty of none of them. None of them. God treated him as if he committed all of them. And he just unloaded his fury for all the sins of all the people who would ever believe him in him in the history of the world. He unloaded all his fury against all their sins on Christ. To borrow the language of Leviticus 16, Jesus became the scapegoat. The scapegoat was guilty of nothing. But the high priest, as it were, laid all the sins of the people on the scapegoat and sent him away. He was without sin. But sin was credited to his account as if he had personally committed it. And then God punished him, though the fact is he never committed any of it. That's imputation. That's imputation. That's the first sign. So the only sense in which Christ was made sin was in the sense that our sins were imputed to him. God treated him as if he was guilty, but he wasn't. You were. You were. And then God just exploded his wrath 
on the innocent Christ who was in our place as our substitute. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That was it. Now go back to the verse. Here comes the, the, the rest of this incredible truth. He made him a new no sin, sin, only in one sense, and that is that he treated him as if he had committed all the sins ever committed by all the people who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. And he did it on our behalf or for us, listen to this, in order that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. That's the other side of imputation. This is just mind boggling to me. Let me tell you what that last half means. Have you ever asked yourself the question, when Jesus came into the world, why did he have to live all those years? And why, you know, if I was planning the plan of redemption, I'd have had him come down on Friday, die, rise on Sunday and go back to heaven Monday. I mean, that was the only deal that needed to happen, wasn't it? You ever thought that through? Why 30 years? Why 30 silent years? Isn't it quite remarkable to you that you have one little tiny vignette in the life of Christ at the age of 12? And that's it. And that's not of monumental theological significance. He was a 12 year old who got separated from his parents and he was wandering around the temple asking questions of the theologians there. And he made the one comment that it needed to be about his father's business, which a, a, a noble Jew could have made a, a devout Jew concerned about things of God. who was his father. But you have 30 years of absolute silence. You have 30 years of no record. Look, this is God on the earth. This is the almighty, glorious God of heaven living in the world. And we have absolutely no information about this. We don't know anything about what happened. I, so many times I've wondered, what kind of a little boy was he? Was he like my little boys? Not a chance. <laughs> was he like your little boys? Not a chance. What was he like? I mean, and, and uh, you know, you have all these apocryphal books about whenever he saw a bird with a broken wing, he healed it and... And whenever he saw a crippled child, he healed him. And, you know, those are fanciful things. What was he like? Well, we know he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. I mean, we know absolutely nothing. You have 30 blank years of the life of God on earth. Isn't that wonderful to think about? I mean, I, I just wish there was a... I wish the Gospels didn't start with the birth of Christ and leap to the baptism. There's 30 years in there. What was going on in there? I'll tell you what was going on. The reason he had to be here all those years was identified at his baptism. When John said, I'm not going to baptize you. Remember that? And he said, no, you have to. I have come to fulfill all righteousness. That was just part of doing what righteousness required. And the reason, listen carefully, that Jesus lived a full life was so that he might live a complete life, fully righteous. That he might live a complete life, absolutely without sin, absolutely perfect. Listen to me. So that that perfect life could be credited to your account. That's the backside of imputation. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived your life so he could treat you as if you lived his life. That's the gospel. That's substitution. I don't think people even grasp the reality of that. The only way God could ever be reconciled to sinners was if sin had been paid for and did it in Christ. And if the sinner was made righteous and he did it in Christ. And that's why Paul in Philippians says, oh, man, all those years I was racking up all that stuff in the gain column, you know, circumcision, tribe of Benjamin, of the nation Israel, Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, you know, a Pharisee, blameless. And then I saw Christ and it was immediately manure. And I found a righteousness not of my own, but the righteousness of God through Christ. What happens when right in justification? God simply declares you righteous because your sin has been paid for. He treated Christ as if he'd committed all your sins and lived your life. And he treats you as if you live Christ's life. That's how the father sees you now. And that happened at the moment of faith, didn't it? That's the gospel. That's what we need to tell sinners. That's the essence of it. And if you take out, listen carefully, if you take out the doctrine of substitution and you take out the doctrine of imputation, you just mess up the message. That's why R.C. Sproul said, I'm an imputationist. You can't tamper with that one. We're not cooperating with infused righteousness trying to become holy so God can declare us righteous. No. In faith, repentant faith, acknowledging our sin, we acknowledge Jesus died and rose again for us. In simple faith, we ask him to save us from our sins. 
And at that moment, the payment of Christ is sufficient for all our sins. And the righteousness of Christ is granted to us. And from then on, God treats us as if we had lived Christ's life. That's why Paul in Romans says, 8-1, there's therefore now no what? Can't be. Can't be. Paid for. Accused with the brother and shows up in heaven. He says, eh, John MacArthur down there, he did this, he did this, he did this. Jesus says, paid for. Oh, yeah, paid for. Paid for. Paid for. Father says, sorry, Satan can't see it. All I can see is the righteousness of Christ. That's the great message of the good news. And uh, this is what we preach. This is the word of reconciliation. There's no cure for the HIV. There is a cure for the SIN. And folks, we are the dispensers. Hang on to this message. It's being assaulted everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. People are caving into this, some knowingly and some unknowingly. The great doctrine of substitution, the great doctrine of imputation, the great doctrine of imputed sin to Christ on the cross and imputed righteousness to us. That's the heart of the gospel message. I walked into a store and I closed with this in uh, Cleveland. Dick Mayhew, the dean of Master Seminary and I were wandering around waiting for a meeting we had to speak at. And we just walked down the street. It was a cold night in Cleveland. And we stuck into a store to keep warm. And there was a guy there. I started talking to this guy. It was a men's store. We just fiddled around there keeping warm and asking him where we could go to get some coffee or tea to drink. And I said, sir, I said, I don't know what your religious background is, but I just want to let you know that uh, if you're ever interested... God will forgive all the sins you've ever committed or ever will commit completely and totally. If you'll just ask him. He said, come on, that's not fair. He said, I'm a moral guy. I work hard at being a moral guy. I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. That's not fair to just forgive all that. You know, I'm, you mean, he said, if some really bad criminal type guy just wants forgiveness, God will forgive him. I said, yeah, he said, that's not fair. That is not fair. I said, well, that's true. I said, I'm not sure you want fair if you think about it. <laughs> but I said, I said, I agree. It's not fair. So I said to him, I said, but, you know, I, I understand. I just want you to know if there ever comes a time, you know, in your life where you just come to the place where you say, I'm so weary of my sin. I'm so fearful about the potential consequences of it. I just want you to know that if you will ask God on the basis of the death of Christ, which I briefly explained to him in his restaurant, if you just ask God to forgive your sins He'll do that. You may never want to do that. But if you ever do, you can just ask on the basis of the death of Christ as a substitute for you. Ah, no, no, that is that is that just can't be right. We went down, we got some coffee and tea. An hour later, we walked back. I think I got to slip in and see this guy again. <laughs> this is exactly what happened. I walked in the door. I said, hi. I said, we're just walking back. I want to thank you for telling us where to go to get something to drink. And he said, I hey, did. Uh, you mean I could just ask any time? <laughs> I said, yeah, absolutely any time. And we gave him some material. And we got back. We sent him some material. That's the message. You understand it? And the heart of it? Well, you should because you're an ambassador for it. Amen? Father, thanks for a great evening for these. There you have it. Now, on one hand, when I hear that, I want to go... I want to shout amen. I want to run around the sanctuary because that is an absolutely amazing message that we should all rejoice over and it should all make us emotional that the eternal son of God, our sins were imputed upon him and his righteousness is imputed to us. Our sins were accredited to his account. God punished all of my sins, past, present, and future on the person of Jesus Christ and Christ per passive and active obedience, and his perfect righteousness was accredited to mine. So I am saved. There is therefore no condemnation. If anyone says, but hey, Trevor did this and Trevor did this and Trevor did this and Trevor did that, you may be right about everything that I did and maybe not even know half of the story. Okay, but guess what? 
God doesn't see any of those things. He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ accredited to my account. That is salvation. That is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. That is a salvation by an imputed righteousness. It's amazing. It's awesome. We should rejoice, and it should it should lead us to a life of repentance and wanting to please God because of God's mercies. That's what should motivate us. And it's because of God's mercy that we should be motivated to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service because we are motivated by his mercy and love. But here is what's so frustrating. MacArthur just preached that. It was amazing. It was awesome. I'm looking at Grace to You website, gty.org. Nine conditions that prove genuine saving faith. Now, he just said, look, all you need to do is ask and believe and you are saved and you have an imputed righteousness. But now I go to the Grace to You website and now how do I know that I was truly saved? How do I know? Now, now, guess what he's going to do? Now, he's going to give us a test to test the evidence of an imputed righteousness. Now, an imputed righteousness by definition does not show itself in a practical way. It's imputed. It's just accredited to my account. But supposedly this imputed righteousness, if I truly have it, it's got to show up in practical ways. Here's how I test to see if I'm truly saved, according to John MacArthur. Number one, love for God. I have to demonstrate a a certain level of love for God. And if I don't, well, then I never got the imputed righteousness. Number two, repentance from sin. Not, and and as he states it here, a proper love for God involves a hatred for sin. In other words, I've got to demonstrate a hatred for sin. I got to demonstrate a turning from sin. I got to demonstrate this. So do I just, is this just a change of mind or does it have to reflect itself in a hatred and stop doing it? Right. And if you go through here, um, well, we could read all through it. Number three, genuine humility. So I've got to love God. I've got to show repentance. I've got to have a genuine humility. Number four, I have to have a devotion to God's glory. Number five, continual prayer. Number six, selfless love. Not a selfish love, a selfless love. And number seven, separation from the world. Number eight, spiritual growth. And number nine, obedience. There you go. That's nine tests. I got to pass that test. If I don't, if I don't do that, so let's go through these again. Let's go through these again. I have to love God. I don't know to what level I have to love God, but if I don't love God enough, my faith is not genuine. Number two, I have to have repentance from sin. I have to have hatred for sin, a turn from sin. I have to, I have to turn from sin and, and start, start sinning less and less. I don't know how much less I have to sin in order to prove that I'm truly saved, but I have to do this. Number three, have to show genuine humility. Genuine humility. If I don't have enough humility, then I'm not truly saved. Number four, have to have a devotion to God's love. Or I'm sorry, a devotion to God's glory. I got to state that correctly. I have to have a devotion to God's glory. How much devotion must be evident to know if I'm truly saved? Number five, continual prayer. I have to pray enough. If I don't pray enough, this demonstrates that I'm never saved. Number six, I have to have a selfless love. I have to show selflessness, right? Not selfishness, but selflessness. Number seven, separation from the world. I have to demonstrate that I'm separate from the world. I don't know if this means in in entertainment, dress, where I go, what I do, but I've got to show some separation from the world. Number eight, spiritual growth. And number nine, I have to demonstrate obedience, obedience. If I don't show enough obedience, I'm never, I was never saved. Now, how do you reconcile that test with what you just heard? How am I saved? By faith. What happens by faith? The imputed righteousness of Christ is accredited to my account. On Christ, Christ, all of my sins, all of it was taken care of. They've been paid for. There is no more condemnation because all of my sins, past, present, and future, have been completely forgiven. Now, how do we reconcile that teaching with this teaching that, well, no, if you're truly saved, you're going to do these nine things? How do you, how do you reconcile that? That's the problem. 
And Christians never want to deal with this. Well, wait a minute. You're saying this, but then you're doing that. You're telling me that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, that his perfect and righteous obedience is now accredited to me. He has imputed his, his righteousness to me. So now before God, I'm perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly obedient, and all my sins have been paid for. And then five seconds later, you're like, but wait a minute. If you don't do these nine things, you are never saved. That. That means that I'm saved not by that imputed righteousness, that I'm ultimately going to be saved by the level of righteousness that I can manifest in my life. How is that any different than Catholicism? You say, well, you don't earn it. Yeah, you say I don't earn it. You say I'm not working for it. But if I don't work and I don't do it, I never got it. So the only way I know I'm saved is I have to constantly be checking to see if all of these things are true. And I'm not looking to the imputed righteousness anymore. That becomes a major problem. And this is a contradictory thing that shows up in church after church after church after church and Christian after Christian when they speak about these subjects. That is what we have to reconcile. MacArthur in that sermon focused on the the salvation that comes by grace alone through faith alone. And it was awesome. It was awesome. How am I saved? Because of what Christ did. What happened to Christ? He, my sins were placed upon him and his righteousness, my my sins, I'll state it in a theologically correct way. My sins were imputed to him. God punished all of my sins. They're gone. So how can you say, well, look, you didn't show enough obedience. My lack of obedience has been forgiven. (laughs) Okay. How can you then use that against me to say that I was never saved? But my sins were placed upon him, imputed upon him. God punished them, and then his righteousness was imputed to me. So now I stand before God perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly obedient. Not practically, but in my position. So then how can you use the the practical evidence to condemn or question the reality of the positional uh, uh, righteousness? It just doesn't make any sense. But there you have it. All right, we needed to finish that today. And we did. So we accomplished that. All right, now I'm going to go home. Hopefully I've accomplished something worth your time today. Thank you for listening. And I should be back. I will plan to be back tomorrow for a number of hours of live broadcasting. And then we'll have our typical Sunday. So if there's something you want me to cover, let me know. Um, If you have any questions, let me know. And again, I'm looking for that first person to be the first person to do this. Go to theologycentral.net. Just scroll. Scroll up on the screen just briefly. Look down at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little circle with a microphone in it. Tap on that. You can leave us a voicemail. So someone be the first. I don't know if it actually works, but it's set up to work. So I'm looking for the first person to give it a, a shot. And I don't I don't even know. I don't know where that voicemail goes. I don't know if I get an email. I don't know what, how it works. So be the first person and leave us a nice voicemail. It will be interesting to see how it shows up. All right. Everyone have a great day. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to hearing from you about anything that we talked about today. God bless.